What's up guys? In this video we'll be talking about the softmax function. Now the softmax function comes up a lot in machine learning, especially in relation to things like neural networks, but perhaps you're here just to learn about it for the sake of learning about it, which is totally fine as well. Now the one other thing I'll say before we start is that it'll be infinitely more useful for you if you watch my video on sigmoids before watching this video on softmax because a softmax is essentially just a multi-dimensional. What happens if we have more than two classes that we're trying to predict in our question? So if you get really comfortable with all the calculations in the sigmoid video, then this is gonna be a breeze for you. So let's get started. Uh, the setup is that we are data scientists for an education system. And our current task is we're trying to predict what major a high schooler will choose when they first enter college. And we'll be using some information like let's say the previous academic history of the student. The model itself really doesn't matter and it's not the point of this video. But just suffice to say that we've built some model which outputs n scores, so S1, S2, all the way to S sub n. So this is how it's multi-dimensional instead of just single dimensional where we are looking at the sigmoid. And each of these SI scores is un unbounded. It's a real number between negative infinity and infinity. But what we can say about these scores is that the higher a score is, the more evidence we have that this high schooler is going to choose the corresponding major. For example, if one corresponds to math, two to physics, and so on, and perhaps corresponds to history, if S1 is much, much higher than all of the other SI values, we have a lot of overwhelming evidence that this student will choose math as their first major when they go to college. However, if S1 is very, very low compared to all the other SI values, we have a very low chance, a very low confidence that they're going to choose math as their first major upon entering college. So that's how we kind of understand these scores. Now, just like in the sigmoids video, our goal is to transform these scores, which are again all unbounded between negative infinity and infinity, into instead a vector of probabilities. So our goal is this, to transform the SIs into P sub I's. So the, we'll end up having some kind of probability for, here's the probability the student will choose math, here's the probability they're gonna choose physics, here's the probability they're gonna choose history, and so on. Now if we're gonna do this, there's a couple of laws we need to obey, because if we're gonna transform it to probabilities, we need two things to be true. The first, it needs to be between zero and one for it to be a valid probability. And the other thing is that the sum of all of these probabilities, so P1 plus P2 all the way to Pn, needs to add up to one. And the human understanding of that is basically the student needs to choose some major, and if we've enumerated all of them, we need to have that sum up to one. Notice currently our S vector, just being some unbounded numbers, has no constraint. Either of these things are probably violated. So we'll need to make sure that's true. Now here's idea number one. And this is kind of just the first thing people would probably do if told to transform these scores into probabilities. And we're gonna see why this is not a good idea, but at the core of it, we always start from the basics. I mean, I personally don't believe in making the math complicated or just coming up with a formula for the sake of coming up with a formula. That's kind of the reason that I switched out of pure math very early on in my career and switched into more applied and computational stuff is that of course the theory matters, but only in relation to the application. That's my opinion. So the idea is that we're going to say that P sub I is equal to S sub I over the sum of all of the scores. And this is the equation, but again, just to pull it back to a human understanding viewpoint, what this is saying is that we're going to divide the score for, let's say, math, if it's S1, by the sum of all of the scores. If the score for math were overwhelmingly higher than all the other scores, then this is going to be very close to 1, which makes sense, because that's saying that we have a high confidence the student's going to choose math as their major. If the score for math were very low relative to the others, then that's going to be some probability close to 0, and therefore we have a very low confidence they're going to choose math as their first major. Now there's a couple things to note. First, of course, many of these scores could be negative. So one implicit thing I've kind of assumed here is that we need to add some constant to each of these scores so that all of them are positive. We see that that's going to cause some issues when we look at the next section, but just assume that's what we did so that we're not adding any negative scores together. Uh, let's see if it obeys these two laws. Is each of these things between 0 and 1? It'll have to be, because if we divide something by the sum of many things, of which the top is a component, of course this will have to be between 0 and 1, so that's fine. Do these things all sum up to 1? Well, if I added P1, P2, P3, 
the numerator is going to be exactly the denominator, so it's going to get 1. So it obeys both the conditions, but we're going to see right now why this, this idea is not great. Let's assume that there was just three majors for simplicity, and let's say the scores were 0, 1, and 2. Now if we go ahead and apply this idea, we're going to have the total be 3, because that's 0 plus 1 plus 2. If I divide 0, which is the S1, by 3, which is the sum, I get 0. Now before going on, this is kind of weird already. I basically said that this first major has no chance that the student is going to select it, and I did that based on the fact that the score was 0. Seems a little bit weird to assign a zero probability just right off the bat. Now, if I divide one by three, I get one third. If I divide two by three, I get two thirds. So we see these probabilities add up to one, and they're all bounded between zero and one. Now, here's where the weirdness starts happening. Let's say that instead of this being the score vector, let's say it was 100, 101, and 102. So the difference is pretty much the same between any pair of elements. It's just that every one of them has gotten a boost of 100. Now that could have just happened through our model for any number of reasons, but it shouldn't really affect the final probabilities. Another way of saying that is we would like our pro final probabilities to be invariant whether or not we add or subtract some constant from all the scores, because the relative difference between all the scores should remain the same. But let's see what actually happens if we still try to use this idea number one. Now if we add these together, it's going to be something like 303, and if I divide either 100 or 101 or 102 by 303, they're all going to be pretty much one-third. So we get 0 0.33, 0 0.33, 0 0.34. So this is kind of telling the story that, oh, I think you're equally likely to fall into any of these categories. And in fact, the bigger constant we add to each of these scores, the even stronger this equality is going to get between components. But this seems weird for us to just add a constant to all the scores and suddenly our probabilities change. That doesn't seem like a good model. And that's why we developed this thing called the softmax. So again, I didn't want to start with here's the softmax. I want to start with what's wrong with this easier thing and why do we need to develop the softmax. So this function right here is called the softmax. So let me write it, softmax. So this softmax is basically the same thing as this idea here, except I take an e, which is Euler's number 2.7, blah, blah, blah. I take an e to the power of each of the things. So I take e to the power of si, and instead of just summing the sj, I do sum of e to the power of sj. Seems like a small change, but it fixes actually a ton of issues for us all at once. Uh, the first thing to note is that it still satisfies these probability assumptions because we're still going to be having these things be between 0 and 1. And of course, if we were to sum up all the pi's, the numerator and denominator will still be the same. Therefore, they do add up to 1. Now one problem it fixes that's really nice is that we don't have to worry about the scores being positive or negative. Because if you take e to the power of anything, it's going to be a positive number. Therefore, we don't need to worry about having any of the scores be uh, positive, negative, having any potential division by zero errors, nothing like that. So that's definitely nice. But the bigger point is that if we were to add a constant to each of our scores, like we did here, where we added 100. So I've done the calculation here where we do pi prime is basically assuming that I were to add a constant c to each of my scores. If I go through that calculation, what you'll see is that this e to the si plus c, remember your rules of exponents, you can just do e to the si and e to the c. Same thing on the bottom, we have e to the sj plus c, this is e to the sj e to the c. You see that this e to the c and this e to the c will just cancel out, and the resulting thing is going to be exactly pi which basically tells the story that if I have my scores and I add or subtract any constant from all of them, that doesn't change my probabilities at all, which is exactly the property that I wanted. So this softmax function fixes that. To close this video, we'll be looking at a couple of derivatives of the softmax function and again, looking at the stories behind them rather than just the numbers. These are gonna be partial derivatives because we're dealing with vectors, so keep that in mind. So if we do partial derivative of pi, which is this guy, with respect to si, so this derivative is basically asking, if I change the score for the current major I'm looking at, let's say math, how does the probability of that major change? You can work through the mathematics. It's a little bit of quotient rule, a little bit of chain rule. But the thing you're going to get in the end is that this derivative is exactly equal to pi times 1 minus pi. Now, if you watch my video on the sigmoid function, this is going to be pretty much parallel. So it's the same calculation. And this, again, makes sense because this is saying that if, let's say, my probability of the student choosing math for their major were already very, very high, something near 1, then if I plug 1 into this guy, it's going to be 0. 
which basically says that the rate of change is going to be zero. Another way of thinking about that is if I'm already very confident the student is going to choose mathematics as their major when they go to college, you telling me the score is changing by a little bit here and there is not going to change that fact. And similarly, if I'm very, very confident that the student will not choose mathematics so that their PI is zero, you telling me the score for mathematics has changed by a little bit will, again, not change that story. Where this function achieves its maximum is if PI is equal to one half, which is the story that I am equally likely that the student will choose mathematics versus all the other majors in my vector. Now, since I don't know which of the buckets it falls into, if you change my score by a little bit, that's going to give me a lot of confidence, which is why my probability changes by a lot for that little change in score. The last thing we'll look at is actually the cross terms derivatives, because now that we're dealing in terms of multi-dimensions, we can actually ask another question, which is what's the derivative of pi with respect to sj? Now let's pause for just a second so we understand what this is asking. Now i and j are going to be different, let's say. If they're not different, we're just dealing with this case. But So they're different, which basically says that how does the probability that the student is going to choose math change if I were to increase the score of history or some other major? Now this should be negative because basically if my score of a different major is going up, that's going to have to detract from the current probability I'm looking at because it can only go down for the current major if I change the if I increase the score for some different major. So that definitely adds up. I didn't do the calculation here. You can do it and I'm pretty confident that you'll be able to carry it out and get this result which is negative pi pj. PI being the probability that the student will choose major I, and PJ being the probability they'll choose major J. Now let's quickly look at the intuition behind this before closing this video out. If either of these is close to zero, so if we were very confident that there's actually a different major altogether the student's going to choose, then changing the score for SJ is not going to change that story much at all. In fact, this is at its biggest in terms of absolute value, so it's actually at its minimum when we have pi and pj equal to both one half. Now think about what that means. If pi and pj are both equal to one half, that means that all the other majors in the list are basically invalid. They're all probabilities are zero. And we're just really trying to choose between is the student going to study math or are they going to choose history? And we have an equal chance of both. Now again, going back to our previous intuition, if you nudge that a little bit by increasing the score of history, for example, then that's going to cause the probability that the student is going to choose math to go down by a lot because we're basically breaking that tie. So this is basically the soft max function. At its heart, it's just a multidimensional version of the sigmoid. But it is helpful to see exactly what's going on in terms of the math and why we choose this formulation instead of this guy over here. So if you have any questions at all, please leave them in the comments below. Like and subscribe for more videos just like this, and I'll see you next time.